welcome to AEW Unrestricted, the official podcast of All Elite Wrestling. I'm Aubrey Edwards here with my best friend, Tony Schiavone. Tony, how are you doing today? It I'm doing great, Aubrey. Wonderful morning. I'm doing great. Thank you for asking. Thank you for calling me your best friend. We've developed very, a very good re working relationship, haven't we? Yes, we have. I think yeah. it's, it's more than working. I mean, like, you're my favorite person to hug at work every day. Yeah, so, yeah. There it's you a go. lot of fun. It is a lot of fun. Also a lot of fun. Have an awesome guest stop by AEW and uh, surprise you, uh, it, it, Mr. Rocky Romero and New Japan star, dog dad, host of Talk and Shop podcast. You've done a lot in this industry, sir, and uh, very, very happy to have you here today. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm, I'm excited to be here. And yes, I most I think important thing is dog dad. Yes, I am a dog yes. dad. Yes. Yeah, no. We, we definitely have to touch on that because Tony Schiavone is a big dog guy, too. So I'm sure you, too. Oh, I didn't know that. Is Bug there? But, uh, yeah, Bug. Bug. There? Yeah, there he is. Bug. He doesn't, he doesn't want to move. He doesn't, he doesn't care. Yeah, it's doesn't too early. give a shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's like, Rocky's yeah. not the only one who thinks it's too early here. Right. Bug's yeah. Like, yeah. I'm going to sleep. I'm going to sleep. All right. I remember it was Jacksonville. It was 3 a.m. or whatever the fuck it was. We were filming Dark. And J.D. Drake's music hits. He comes out. And then all of a sudden, here's Rocky Romero. I'm sitting in the stands, and I look over. I'm like, is this is this freaking Rocky Romero of, like, New Japan, of, like, Rapungi Vice? Like, oh, my God. How did this happen? This is insane. You guys have an awesome match. Trent comes out at the end. You've got this nice reunion. How, how, did, this, how did this all start? How did this happen? Well, uh, I, it, it all started, uh, you know, Honestly, when Kenny Kenny Omega reached out and kind of like this was nobody had had crossed over yet between you know AEW and New Japan, quite, you know, in some in some time. I think maybe Moxley maybe had done some stuff and maybe Jericho, you know, came over to Japan, but then nobody had really done anything since the pandemic started. And uh, and Kenny reached out and was like, "Hey, I got this idea, and I would love to, you know, I'm working with Moxley." And um, I would love if Kenta could come over and, and work a program because I know we, we had been building on the New Japan side a match between Kenta and, uh, and Mox. So he was like, let's see if we can get these guys over over and, and can you check on your side with New Japan and see if we can make it happen. And I checked and we made it happen. Kenta came over and that was kind of like the first forbidden door interaction you know, or whatever. And, uh, and, and it worked really, really well. And the, the fans perceived it great. And, and, uh, that was my first time in, in the famous Jacksonville where, you know, the tapings had been happening and, uh, and where I feel like AEW really like became a community, right? You know, yeah. that's from what I've heard, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and it, everybody, everybody was awesome, you know, like those tapings were so much fun and, uh, I had a great time and, and that was, you know, first time I met Tony Khan in person. And, you know, we hung out a little bit and had a great conversation and, and really kicked things off to what happened in the future a year or so later. But, um, but yeah, that, that, so when we talked there, Tony was like, yeah, maybe next time, you know, maybe we can do this, this thing. Cause like Tony's like, I love Rapunny Vice. You know, I, I went mm -hmm. and saw, uh, you know the the show that that New Japan had in Long Beach, like one of the first New Japan shows that that we had did, like bigger New Japan shows that we had done in America. And he was like, and I had gone on the show and I saw the Bucks versus Rapunky Vice, and I, I love that rivalry. He's like, and I, I would love to to at some point maybe we can do you know some kind of reunion in AEW. And I was like, yeah, that that'd be awesome. You know, not really thinking you know, it would happen anytime soon. And then, you know, like, I think like a month or two later, then, you know, that was that moment where I wrestled JD on dark and, uh, and Trent came out. And I think Trent was still injured at that time. Right. And, uh, I we think had he this, was. Yep. yeah, we had the, we had the big hug at the end and the high five. And uh, it was just a really, really cool moment. Yeah. Uh, Tony, uh, Khan loves Rapungi vice. You know that. I mean, he, he can, oh, yeah. he can sing your song. I mean, mm. that's, <laughs> he knows all the words. He does. Like, he knows. He, he, he knows all the words, words. <laughs> and we've heard him sing it before. So there you go. So that's always pretty cool to have the owner yeah. uh, love uh, your tag team. Uh, the, you went on November to wrestle uh, uh, Brian Danielson uh, on AEW Dynamite. Uh, how about that match? That was pretty cool. Yeah, that was super cool. So me and Brian, obviously, you know, we go back uh, like quite a bit. We both 
were training in LA at the, at the new Japan dojo in 2002, we both went over on the same trip. We were part of the LA dojo group or team. And we both went over to new Japan for the first time in October of 2002, where we debuted in the Tokyo. Dome. So it's like, you know, it's like we went, they just put us right into it, you know? So we're wrestling like Boom. Liger and Tiger mask wow. and, uh, and, and these like big yeah. name legends. And sure. they put us right in the opening match and, you know, 50,000 plus people. And it was like, boom, right off to the races. You know, I remember like right before we were about to go out, they just said, you know, just don't look up because you look up and you just see this sea of people in this huge, you know, baseball uh, stadium, you know. And and first thing you do, you're walking down the ramp. I just looked straight up and just saw so many people. And I was like, oh, no, this is real. This is happening. <laughs> 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 Why did I look up? But uh, but yeah, so you know, me and Brian have have had a, a great relationship over the years, and obviously he went and did his thing, and you know I see working in Japan. So uh, I was in Japan, uh, and Tony called me and was like, I don't know, maybe like five a.m. or something, and I was like, oh, what's going on? I pick up the phone. He's like, Hey, I got this great idea. I talked to Brian. He wants to do it. And he's like, uh, You know, we want to bring somebody into to wrestle to Brian. Brian, I'm like, yeah, okay, cool. Yeah. You know, not thinking it was going to be me. And he goes, yeah, but oh no, it's you. I want, I want to bring you to wrestle Brian. I was like, Oh (laughs) me. I was like, okay. Um, yeah, let's do it. You know? So, uh, I I think I flew back to, to LA for like a day or something, collected my stuff and then, and then headed over to, um, to, uh, to AEW, the AEW tapings and, and Russell Bryan. And that was just a really, really cool moment. And it was one of my favorite matches that I've done probably ever because, it was just cool to to wrestle Brian on that stage, you know, so like so much later in our careers, and and I don't know, I just it was really cool. It was great because I'd always been wrestling Brian, always in the dojo, training with him every day, you know, five days a week, and we wrestled, um, I think, in like a best of Super Junior American Final match, and like we had all these different matches, and we had ROH matches that we had wrestled. So like this was just kind of cool to put like another one of these matches together with him uh, under such different circumstances, you know? Right. Before we get to kind of more forbidden door and a bigger concept, you had kind of alluded like getting Kenta to AEW and uh, you coming over with, uh, to do match with Brian, like Tony's reaching out to you. So you're very involved with talent on the new Japan side. And could you talk about your role a little bit more and kind of how that came about? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I think ever, you know, ever since like the dojo back in 2002, I've kind of like always, I don't know, like the offices, you know, New Japan, like office and staff and like higher ups have always just, I guess maybe like trusted me in some kind of way. So like, even like back then, like, uh, you know, that was like the go-to guy, you know, the point man at the dojo to like, you know, like, Hey, you know, what do you guys, you know, want to do for training? Like, what do you guys think we should be doing and trying to help kind of like form, like, I don't know, some kind of leadership role, I guess, you know? And, uh, so then like it, it, that became official. We started working with ring of honor, I think in like 2000, I want to say like 2013, 14, something like that. And, uh, and, and then me and Tiger Tori both kind of helped build that relationship with, with new Japan and ring of honor and, uh, and, and kind of, so tiger kind of like started to groom me for like this position, which was his position until he retired to like kind of scout talent and, uh, and kind of be the liaison for like any wrestling overseas. Uh, and so I kind of just kind of fell into that position and then it became a little bit more official and, uh, and now here I am. <laughs> helping uh, form the relationship for AEW in, in New Japan. Yeah, you're very instrumental in putting together Forbidden Door between the two companies. Talk about how all that started. I know it's a, probably it was a long process. I know Tony kind of kept it close to the vest. We all thought, you know, eventually we're going to do something we think, and then all of a sudden Forbidden Door happens. How did that all come together? Yeah, I mean, it was like... I think the the whole thing from like concept to to execution was probably like ten months or so. I want to say it was almost probably a year. And, and uh, 
I think I was telling the story recently, but I think the way it happened was I think I was somewhere. Me and Tony had been texting back and forth. And uh, and then I was just like, Tony, maybe we just do like a really cool event together where it's like New Japan and AEW. And, you know, maybe there's some crossover matches, but, you know, maybe we're separated, you know, and AEW does a couple matches of their own and New Japan does a couple of their own. But it's just like a super show kind of like fun event, you know? And he was like, yeah. And then he started coming up with match ideas right off the yep. right off the, <laughs> the bat, you know? It started yeah. Throwing, Sounds like Tony. Yeah. So like <laughs> some of the concept was still there. Like the original idea of uh, Okada, it was like Okada and um and Hangman against yeah. Jay and uh and and Cole was right. was kind of built from that that day one, that first conversation ten months ago. That you know, so like not as obviously formed into the four way, but originally those guys were going to be together. So it's kind of funny that like some of the ideas that he originally had thought of right off the bat and just kind of throwing stuff out there actually stuck and we ended up, you know, it actually happened, you know, which was cool. So, um, but yeah, th- that's kind of how it started. And then we just kind of put it on the back burner. Then I ended up getting a, a, a I think I talked to Chris Harrington one day. Uh, yeah. at one of the tapings and Chris was like, so I guess this is kind of like moving. He's like, you know, we, we've got a couple of dates, you know, could you go back to your people and check the date? Cause I mean, obviously that's the biggest deal, right. Is getting the schedule of two, two, you know, major companies like that and trying to like figure out a date where this thing actually works. And, uh, and uh, so we went back and forth with that, secured that. And then, um, then it was like, okay, so we're like planning this thing and, and like, a, you know, 10 months, almost a year or whatever. So, uh, so we went back and forth with that. We, we secured the date. Everything was good. Then it kind of didn't hear anything, you know, when nothing was moving. But then all of a sudden, like, the stuff starts happening, like, behind the scenes, Chris starts emailing me. And then, you know, like, and then it's like, you know, now we're talking, like, contracts. And I'm going back and forth between Japan and trying to figure out how everything is going to work. And, and, then, uh, and then the last piece of the puzzle was, was the talent and putting everything together. So right. that kind of came, like, like a whirlwind because um, obviously like, like AEW was coming off of a big pay-per-view, you know, their own pay-per-view, then going into blood and guts. So there was a lot going on there. And then new Japan as well uh, had their second biggest show of the year dominion. So there was a lot like, and that had just ended two weeks like a or week so. before. Yeah. Yeah. A week yeah before, like a week whatever. before was, forbidden door. Yeah. It was. So the whole thing was like a whirlwind on both sides and it, you know, all their storylines and trying to connect everything with Tony and like trying to go back and forth between new Japan and Tony and like get it all done. And, but ended up working out then of course, obviously like people started getting injured and, you know, mm. uh, you know, a couple people had fever or like, you know, wow. Touch and go there. it was, yeah. <laughs> it was crazy. It was and crazy. It was, it was literally like every day something was happening yeah. and I'm just, Tony's <laughs> either texting me or calling me or I'm calling him and I'm just like, you're not going to believe this. He's like, no, oh no. It was just like, no, just <laughs> don't even call me anymore. Just don't even know. No. So uh, it, it was a, it was a rough, that, that week was rough. And, yeah. um, but it, it, to see, you know, how much fun the show was and how great the show was and how smooth it was. And, and just seeing like all the fans talk about the show and like what an awesome event it was. Uh, I, it was all, it was, it was all, we knew it was going to be okay because you have this collection of amazing talent, like the, the best talent in the world, you know, coming together, uh, and in two great companies that, that know how to put on a show and, and, you know, we come together and we knew it was going to be a, a home run either way, you know, yeah. we just had to get through it, you know, and, uh, and we did. And now it's, you know, it was one of the most talked about, uh, wrestling events of all time. And, and here we are. Yeah, it's it's it, it was an incredible show. It was one for the ages. All of the matches yeah. were just so great. And thank you so much for for being a part of it. Speaking of being a part of it, like you and Trent wrestled FTR and Great O'Con and uh, Jeff Cobb. And I just love the fact that like you and Trent had joined back up in forces and had some matches on Dynamite. Rapungi Vice is back. How is it for you, not only from the planning side of getting everyone involved, but also just getting to be a part of the show? 
yeah, that's a huge deal to me. You know, again, I, I wasn't uh, ever thinking that I was going to be a part of the show kind of when this, all this started and even, you know, towards the end. But um, I, I, I'm definitely glad that I got to be a part of it because then it, it kind of felt, you know, I'm a wrestler first and for, foremost, you know, I mean, that's like always going to be the important thing to me while I can still do it, especially, you know, um, cause I'm not going to be able to wrestle for it. You know, that's, that's just the truth, of course. So, um, so to be able to, to wrestle in the United center and like to, to wrestle on this, you know, historic pay-per-view event and to know that I put like, you know, so many hours and time into it. And, and it, I felt so passionate about the event because I was so close to it, uh, to be able to wrestle on it is a huge deal, an absolute huge deal. And, uh, and, and I'm glad and lucky and happy that I got to, to actually wrestle on it too. You know, like if I don't get to wrestle on, on another forbidden door show in the future, I mean, I'd love to, but it's okay. Cause at least I did the first one and that was the most important one to me. We're talking with Rocky Romero, who is obviously, as you know, much more important than just a member of Rapungi Vice. He's a man of many talents, not the least of which is keeping things together. When podcasting with two of the craziest guys I've ever been around in my life. Oh, fuck. The, the Good Brothers. We'll talk about that and more when we continue on Unrestricted. AEW Unrestricted continues with our good buddy Rocky Romero of Rapungi Vice. Uh, you're uh, very involved with uh, New Japan Strong. Uh, what are your goals for New Japan Strong? Yeah, uh, New Japan Strong is is definitely, you know, like it, it wasn't a thing that was supposed to like be anything. You know, like we had this kind of long term plan to to build New Japan of America and and build around the LA dojo talent that trains under Shibata there, the younger talent and new blood of, of new Japan. And, um, the pandemic happens and obviously everything stops. So like we had to kind of think quickly about what we could do, uh, with our resources and, you know, to keep things going and moving and, and moving forward. Uh, and the concept and idea of like, Oh, well we can tape, uh, you know, this one hour, 45 minute, you know, wrestling show for New Japan World and Fight TV and, and create content uh, for the fans. So the concept of New Japan Strong started off of that. And, you know, we we started to collect talent and started looking for talent and, you know, in, in kind of around in the Los Angeles area, you know, started, then we started to spread out a little more across the country and, and start bringing people in. But uh, yeah, the the whole thing about New Japan Strong is is definitely about building the next generation of of uh, of stars for New Japan, and and now uh, it's kind of you know become this fun little touring uh, group that we have that that helps to support you know some of our bigger events in in New Japan of America. So you know we can build storylines that are actually you know build to a like finale where we'll have a pay-per-view and that this now the pay-per-view we bring in like okada and tanahashi and you know some right. of the bigger stars but we can can focus on uh on the younger stars and, and the build to that and kind of building them up and getting them ready you know back to japan and now that the borders are open and you know uh you can go back and forth and you know much easier than you could you know six months ago uh now that's the you know the big focus so like clark connors is a great you know, part of that, you know, yeah. and, and, you know, the focus Clark. around, yeah, Clark is an amazing wrestler. He's uh, he's such a hard worker and, uh, you know, he we built storylines around him and giving him an opportunity to, you know, to really learn, you know, really learn and, and get him ready for, uh, for when he got, you know, for when an opportunity comes and like, you know, we saw at forbidden door that, uh, you know, because she got injured, Clark was the guy who stepped in and, and, you know, a lot of fans were like, why is this, who is this guy, you know, not knowing who he was, you know, who is this guy and why is he there? Why, why don't they have a bigger start? And the guy handled it like a pro walked in there, showed him, you know, showed everybody what he had. And, you know, they had, they built an awesome story around Clark's kind of not being able to do anything uh, to Miro during the match or any to these bigger stars. And then all of a sudden he gets the one moment, sends Miro through the table on the outside, goes on this crazy run. And now, you know, you've got 15,000 plus people, you know, uh, cheering and, and chanting, let's go Clark. 
you know? So what, yeah, a, what yeah. an amazing moment for him, you know? And, and that's kind of the cool thing is about wrestling is, you know, you always got to be ready because you don't know what's going to happen and you might just get this crazy opportunity and, you know, your, your whole life changes in a, in a moment, you know? So that's insane. Yeah. So that's, I feel like that's kind of what new Japan strong is, is just kind of getting those guys ready for those kind of situations and, uh, and, you know, and, and kind of like fine tuning talent. So, you know, for the bigger picture. Awesome. Yeah. I love the, the match started and it's like, who the hell is this Clark Connors guy by the end of the match? Oh, Clark Connors is a star. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Everyone knows who he is now. This is yeah, awesome. Yeah. I've, I've known him for a while cause he's up from, uh, from near Seattle. So it was like, oh right. man, this guy just needs a big break and he finally got it. I'm so, so proud of him. It's awesome. Uh, I want to talk about your training background a little bit cause you actually trained at the LA dojo in the late nineties. Uh, what brought you to the new Japan dojo? So, I mean, uh, I mean, I've always been a huge fan of like Japanese pro wrestling and, and kind of always been, uh, I don't know, fascinated with, you know, with Japan and fascinated with, um, just the, you know, kind of wrestling culture in general. And so I got the opportunity. I, I met a guy named Justin McCulley, who was a, he was a former UFC fighter and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belt. And he was in with like the Inokis, you know, Antonio Inoki. And he kind of like had trained under him a little bit and they had done business together, you know, as a fighter. And, and he introduced like Samoa Joe introduced me to him. So he was kind of friends with Samoa Joe and, you know, we're all talking. He was like, yeah, we're about to start this and open this LA dojo in Santa Monica, California. It's going to be basically Antonio Inoki's like kind of private gym. Uh, but New Japan is funding it and and we're looking for some guys who want to basically start there. So we're like, okay. So, you know, me and Ricky Ray, as we said, we were interested, you know, we were the uh, Havana Pitbulls at that time. And uh, we we were like immediately like oh this could be a great opportunity this could be finally be the opportunity that gets us over to Japan. So when Joe came and trained, I think uh, maybe Joe reached out to Danielson. Danielson came down, just moved all the you know to L.A. and on a whim and just was like yeah this is what I want to do. I want to work for New Japan. I want to you know while I'm you know Ring of Honor star and doing all this other stuff. So we're all just kind of collected TJP. Uh, so we're all kind of collected, you know, this little group of, of wrestlers that, uh, you know, that ended up do, all doing kind of their own thing. But here we are, we're just training every day, like watching tape, you know, tons of tapes. And it was it was really cool because basically for like a year and a half, two years, that's all we did was just focus on wrestling every single day. We had this beautiful facility that we could use uh, whenever we wanted. And, uh, and it was just really, really cool. It was like, a color, it, it, I don't know, like, um, nobody really, you know, we didn't have much structure. So it was just, you know, we, you could walk into the dojo at any point and, and, you know, whatever, you know, we'd be, you know, sharing wrestling techniques or like we'd be doing jujitsu that day or something with, with, uh, with Justin and, uh, you know, Inoki would come in and then Inoki would start teaching like some really, cool old like catch wrestling stuff and then you know start talking about like wrestling philosophy you know his, in his own way you know and like comparing it to like music and a song and this and that and talking about crescendos and like and it was just like it was just a really unique and cool opportunity then the next day you show up and the like ddp would show up or like boss rootin or like just somebody like just everybody, this guy, you know, he's so well connected to everybody. So like somebody would, would just come in and then you would just get these crazy lessons of whatever it was. It was, it was very cool and a, a really, really unique experience to, to have as a young man. And then, you know, to just kind of take all that knowledge and look and reflect on it back. It was like, that was awesome. You know, like what a, what a cool, you know, wrestling course that, that I don't think most people will actually get, you know, because you get so much more than just the actual wrestling and techniques. It's but like, it's like people's experiences that they're sharing with you and what worked and what didn't work in their lives and, and careers that you're getting, you know? Yeah. It's uh, being able to train, uh, being, being trained by Antonio Noki is a big deal. I would think for anybody. I yeah. Mean, that's, that's something you'll take with you the rest of your career. The rest of, I mean, not, not many can say that. So, that has to be really, really cool. I want to ask you about Ring of Honor because uh, you were also a ROH World Tag Team Champ with Davey Richards. Talk about your time there. 
or yeah. wrestling well, ring of honor? Tony, I was I was uh, champion with Ricky Reyes, Ricky David Reyes, Richards, Davey, and okay. and Alex Kozlov. So three wow. time, yes, three time champ. tag team champ. Very cool. Almost with Trent, but he he lost. I mean, uh, we'll just say he lost at Forbidden Door. <laughs> we'll blame it on him. We'll, we'll blame it on there him. You so when you was, but... when you when you found out, uh, how did you hear about Tony Khan uh, buying Ring of Honor, and what was your thoughts on that? So. You know, I th- I think the news broke, and yeah. and I was like, oh shit! I was like, oops! Oh oh, Tony, <laughs> say shit here. Tony, okay. Yeah, I was like, Tony bought Ring of Honor, and then I got like a text, maybe like thirty minutes later, where, and, and for Tony apologizing, hey, hey man, I couldn't re- I couldn't really tell you. It was like a last second thing, <laughs> but like the deal went through, and he's like, I, I wanted to tell you so bad, but uh, but yeah, I have you know, I bought Ring of Honor, and and we're gonna do like some stuff. So I hopefully that we you know we can uh, we can collaborate on some Ring of Honor and New Japan stuff. And I was like, oh, that's that's really cool, but uh, yeah, very shocking, but glad that Tony bought it. You know, I, I think that obviously like the library is in good hands, and um, kind of. The, the history of Ring of Honor is in, in good hands with somebody who I think would do a really good job to preserve it and take care of it the right way. So I think that that's really important. And, and obviously, like it seems like kind of like talking to Tony and little bits and pieces that, you know, you kind of hear around from interviews and stuff that, you know, and, and news bits. But like Ring of Honor will be similar to maybe like a New Japan Strong where like there's a focus on the younger on the younger side of, you know, talent that could be a part of AEW later or whatever it might be. But like, I think that that's really cool. And that's what ring of honor kind of was originally. And you saw the growth and, and, and wrestlers that came out of that f- kind of first ring of honor group and second ring of honor group. Uh, and now, you know, look where everybody's at. So like, I think that that's, that's, that's really cool that the legacy will kind of live on, you know? Right. So I know that you were involved with Final Battle, December 2021. This is before Tony buys Ring of Honor, but I think at this point everyone knew that it was sort of like this might be the last show. What did you, you had a match on the show? It was I think like Deppen was there, Brody King was there, EC3. There was a lot of people. Uh, what kind of emotions were you feeling on that show, knowing that like this this might be the end, and not really knowing what the future looks like for Ring of Honor? I think it just didn't seem real. It was just like. Mm-hmm wait what like 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 you could take it in like oh ring of honor's ending but like yeah. nobody knows it's legit what's gonna the happen. final battle <laughs> yeah, yeah it's <laughs> legit the final battle but um i don't know i don't think anybody could really truly like believe it it just seemed so strange you know because ring of honor had been around forever you know and and uh, you know i remember the first ring of honor show and I had, you know, I just started wrestling, you know, a couple of years before that year or two before that, but like the first Ring of Honor show and, and thinking like, man, I, I'm going to get on that one day. I'm going to be a part of, you know, Ring of Honor, whatever they're, what they're doing is so cool. And then, to, you know, to be able to be a part of it just a few years later after that, and then to see its growth, you know, New Japan, Ring of Honor, you know, we did Madison Square Garden just a couple of years, uh, years ago and, you know, right before the pandemic. And then to be on the final battle where it's like, this is it. It just didn't seem real, you know? And and there was so much emotions for, you know, the wrestlers backstage, uh, you know, especially like after the match, you know, when you're the most emotional and and your adrenaline has spiked and and you're kind of coming back down. Uh, I, you know, for a lot of people there, you know, they were, they were losing their jobs, you know, it was, un- they were, there was a lot of uncertainty and that was like the part that, that, that sucked the most, you know, was, was seeing that. Like, I never like to see people, you know, in that kind of position. That's, that's always terrible and rough, you know? So like I, I was, you know, a lot, a lot of the folks, you knew were going to bounce back and there's going to be other opportunities, but you know, for some people there, they, you know, it was going to be a, a long, tough road, you know? So, and I think that, I, you know, one thing about Tony Khan is he, you know, he's good. He's a dude with a good heart, you know, and, and he yeah. kind of has always like taking care of people. And, you know, during the pandemic, there was a lot of wrestlers that, you know, he, he continued to use each week at, you know, at the dark tapings and at the, you know, uh, dynamite and rampage tapings, you know, just, and kept people working when that time when there wasn't any work, there was, you know, there was no wrestling going on 
at all, you know, all over the world, you know? So I, I think that, you know, he, he definitely gave a lot of ring of honor people, you know, one off or two offs jobs here and there and looked at people and then to obviously buy the product and, and still keep true to it and have ring of honor wrestlers on that, on that show that he, when he bought um, Supercard at Supercard of honor, I think that was really cool. So, yeah, I, 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 uh, I'm just glad to see that it's going. And I know death, death before dishonor is coming up and I'm really, really curious to see how that goes. And, um, I'm just excited. I think, I think that, you know, there's a lot that you can do with that property and that into, you know, the intellectual property and, and, uh, and I just want to see more people get more opportunities. I think that's, that's really what I want to see. Yeah. That's, that's, that's very important for the business. It really is because you, you, Give people opportunities, you can find a star. You really can. Exactly. And yeah. we will learn. I uh, want to talk just a little bit before we have to go to break about uh, the gimmicks, podcasting mm-hmm. with our buddies, uh, because uh, I know the Good Brothers very well. I know how they are. Uh, how's that How's that all working out? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's going, Tony. <laughs> okay. It's working. <laughs> you know, it's working. Working with the good brothers is, you know, it's yeah. taking it's taking years off my life. Let's just be honest. You <laughs> I know. know. I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, no, I love those guys. They're, they're literally two of my best friends in the world. You know, right. Carl Anderson was the best man at my wedding. You know, he's another guy that that I met at the original LA dojo. And, you know, fast forward, you know, whatever, 15 years later, you know, he's he's the best man at my wedding, you know, so uh we i love those guys they're the probably the two of the funniest craziest people i've ever met and some i think somehow the trio works out because i'm a little more level-headed i guess you know but like <laughs> a little a, a lot little. a lot more level-headed yeah <laughs> but but like i also like i don't know they, they i just have so much fun with them you know i just they, i've never i've never laughed so much uh you know when i'm with those guys it, it's amazing so like and um so yeah, we've been doing this podcast talking shop uh, for the uh, for a few a few years. We did it. We started it in 2015, then you know, kind of we we did it for a year and a half, and then we were just like over it. We hated podcasting. We cursed it. We were like, when you know, Dan Housen did, and we were never uh, we're never going to do it again. And then uh, Chad Gowers, never never. Uh, <laughs> yeah, never say never. They got they got released from WWE and I, and we were like well I guess we're back to podcasting yeah oh, everybody was excited about it and now it's been uh, like two years and now we're all over it again so oh. we <laughs> so we're taking a little bit of a, a hiatus and we called we called the first two years season one and now we're gonna take a, a little bit of a break but we're gonna come back with season two and with a bang because uh, you know we're, we do want to do these talk and shop pay-per-views because those are the most fun. That's sure. that's what we really want to do. So we're going to do a, a, a talk and shop mania pay-per-view, I think coming out of what we do it in season two. And um, yeah, it's just a really fun podcast. It's an easy listen, a lot of burping, a lot of drinking, mm-hmm. <laughs> a lot of curse words, but mm-hmm. it, it, it's, it, but it's definitely like a great example of wrestlers in the wild. Yeah. <laughs> just being wrestlers oh, yeah. <laughs> it's like that's like the best version of it you know yeah. so um but yeah it's a it's a lot of fun and then uh yeah we've been working on this project um that's produced by mila kunis which is called the gimmicks right and it's an nft project uh it's web three a web three animated series mm. where uh there's it follows four wrestlers who are who are trying to get this independent promotion up and running and i don't know it's been a lot of fun seth green was in one of the uh one of the last episodes and, and so it's got a it's 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 fun it's cool and um i'm kind of curious to see where that goes so yeah my, my character's chico luchador is uh is awesome i mean to be honest like i've had so much fun uh you know for i never, never thought i'd be a voice actor so I'm, I'm doing that and that's you know a ton of fun and it's really cool and I'm kind of learning on the on the fly as we go, and yeah, the episodes that turned out, I'm just like I did, 
oh, I was a part of that. Oh, that was actually kind of yeah. funny, you know, like surprising myself. So uh, it's just a really cool opportunity and uh, it's been a lot of fun. So shout out, check out the, the real gimmicks.com. If you want to watch the episodes, I think there's about 16 or episodes or so. And I think they're going to do 20 for the season. And I think okay. it sounds like we're greenlit for it to do another season after that. So, awesome. Yeah. Very so uh, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. Check it out. Awesome. Little little did we know, Rocky Romero, voice acting credit. Fantastic <laughs> yeah. job, sir. We're talking go. to Rocky Romero on AEW Unrestricted. Coming up, we got fan questions, and I also want to hear about your dogs. This is AEW Unrestricted. Aubrey and Tony here with Rocky Romero. He's absolutely awesome. We've talked a lot about New Japan. We've talked about the Good Brothers. We've talked about everything, but we haven't talked about your dogs yet. And you are a self-proclaimed dog dad. You've got Dookie and Honey Butt, I think, are yeah. their names. Yeah. Well, Dookie Butt and Honey Bear. That's there. Oh, we go. Yeah. Yeah. Dookie it was like butt. there's got to be a button there somewhere. How- <laughs> yeah. when, when did you become a dog person? Have you always been a dog person? No, I didn't grow up with dogs. At all. We had we had a cat when I was like maybe like 12 I mean, i think we got a cat you know and he he's he was he stuck around for a long time he's like 15 or 16 before he, wow. he passed but um uh but yeah never had a dog in the house so didn't really understand the conversation of you know dog owner versus cat owner or anything like that like it couldn't really chime in to those conversations but uh my my wife had had you know tons of dogs growing up and you know she was like i want to get a dog i want to get a dog and i was like I don't know because I'm tra- I travel so much and it's so hard, you know, to have to have a dog. It seems like, and I'm so glad we did it. But we went and and I was like, we're just gonna go look at the dogs. We're just gonna go oh. look. So we went to this yeah. rescue <laughs> center uh, in in LA, and um, we just looked. And of course, she wanted. You know, we we saw Duke. We met Duke that day, and of course, she was like, I, I want to get him. I want to get him. And I was like, I don't think we should get him. And I was like trying to come up with any excuse, you know, to like convince myself not to get the dog, even though I wanted the dog so badly. And uh, so then we, we left, we walked out and uh, we went and got lunch and we, you know, we went back to the house and, uh, and she was like, I think we should go back and, and just meet him again and just look at him again. And I was like, <laughs> it was like 20 minutes later, 30 minutes later. I'm like, uh, Okay. I was like, I'm going to go, but I'm not going to bring my wallet because then if I bring my wallet, then, you know, I'll start the process of everything and, and, and get him, you know, and start paying it for everything to get him uh, rescued. So uh, I secretly brought my wallet and uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and we walked in there. And I think within like three minutes of walking in there, Duke was in Emily's hands and arms. And, uh, and I was already filling the paperwork out to, to adopt him. So, and that was like literally the greatest thing I think I've ever done because I, I love my dog so much and, and do completely like change our life. And, um, and I, and we always talk about it so funny, like just how much he like made us a family, you know, like Mm -hmm. me and my wife, like it really made us a family, like having Duke, you know, and, uh, and just kind of like having a puppy is so hard, especially in the beginning. And we, we didn't know what we were signing up for. And it was like, I mean, he tore our first apartment to shreds. It felt like, <laughs> and uh, I paid so much money to get out of that apartment at the end. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah. Then we ended up uh, adopting Honey. I think three years after Duke, and uh, and then she was not, she was not like Duke. She was an easy, easy puppy. And um, and and now it really feels like we are complete. We have this completed family. Um, I, I love those two. They're, they're, they're literally, we treat them like our children. Yeah. Like it's, 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 it's awesome. Yeah. I'm, I'm with you on every step there, brother. <laughs> they, they change your life for the better. They really do. 100%. They bring yeah. us so much joy and so much happiness. And, yeah. and they, it's, it's so crazy to know, like know their, how in tune they are with us, you know? Mm-hmm. So like when we're having a bad day, they literally just come over and like look at us in the eyes and just like basically say like, it's going to be all right here now pet me i'm cute as hell you know so and we do and it makes yeah. us feel good you know yeah. it's really amazing what kind of uh animals they are yeah uh let's get to some fan questions uh pauline wants to know this is at pauline on twitter 
What inspired you to include the eye patch as part of your gear? Uh, so there's a rapper, Slick Brick, from the mm -hmm. 80s and early 90s. Uh, so yeah, I think I was, I don't know why, but maybe somebody in a song was talking about Slick Rick and then I started to think like, oh, you know, it'd be cool if I added an eye patch, you know, nobody really like, but like, I'll do something cool. Like I'll put like my face on it or, you know, or I'll put like a really cool design on it or something. So then I, I came up with the ideas of like having different eye patches for different outfits. And, uh, and then I started to think like, oh, well, this is going to be an easy merch thing. You know, like this, this will be, so, you know, because everybody's selling T-shirts, everybody's selling hats, nobody's selling spoken like, like a true worker, <laughs> <laughs> custom eye patches. You know, so then, uh, so that was kind of the inspiration. Really, was 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 merchandise and, and kind of like how to play it. But um, but yeah, so I, I I did that, and then I, and then it became fun because it was like I was designing eye patches for you know different situations, you know, and and that was really cool. So. Um, so yeah, so and then I just kind of stuck with it. Now I've, I've simplified it a little bit more. I've just got like one or two eye patches. Um, but I don't know, I think it's just a really cool look when, you know, coming to the ring and making it a part of the entrance gear. Yeah. And I know it's so wrestling to like, you know, there's no story. I didn't get like blinded in one eye or you right. know, something <laughs> happened. So I think like I was walking, uh, I was, uh, I think I did dark or something and, and Mark Henry was on commentary and he, and he, and he, I don't know if he started to make up a story of why my, <laughs> I, he, I know he did. I'm sure something, he did. Something yeah. happened oh. and he walked and he goes back. He's like, I didn't know what to say about your, about your, about your eye and your eye patch. So I just like made up a story about it. He's like, but what, what's the, what's the background behind it? And I was like, there is none, Mark. I just wanted to sell merch. You know, he's like, he's like, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, so like, uh, but yeah, uh. there's no, there's no, you know, I didn't, you know, I didn't, it wasn't Moxley getting blinded by Jericho or whatever it was you right. know, or anything. It's just uh, Rocky wanted to sell merch. Yeah. It's almost <laughs> better that way. It's, it's, yeah, so, it it's so wrestling. It's such a wrestling <laughs> yeah. reason. Like, hey, I want to make money. What, what can yeah. I sell that other people aren't selling? Oh, my God. So great. You know, when I asked that question, you should have just looked at the camera very stoic and said, I refuse to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> and then the mystique is still there, right? Right. Let's, let's let's redo it. Let's redo it. <laughs> All right, take two, everybody. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, exactly. All right. Got a question from Adam on Twitter. How does it feel being one of the most important people in wrestling these past few years, helping with New Japan and the AEW partnership become what it is today? He also says, I honestly appreciate it. Thank you so much. Uh I don't know. <laughs> uh no, I mean look, I'm, I'm just glad it's happening. You know, I, I mean, it's a lot of hard work, uh, you know, trying to get everybody on, on, you know, on the same page to, you know, two companies that, that run two completely different businesses, you know, one very much TV model, one more of a touring group. So like, you know, just getting everybody together and, and understanding was, was really, really uh, important and it took time, but I feel like now we're in a great position after forbidden door to easily do forbidden door two if and when it does happen um because now there's a really a great understanding i think between both companies and, and kind of how they work so um i don't know uh, an important person i mean i don't know i just I just do what i do i'm trying to you know just really do some cool stuff in the wrestling business and and, and create opportunities like we talked about you know for other people i mean that's that's what's really important to me very cool very cool uh the los wants to know Favorite Japanese McDonald's menu item? McGriddle, of course. McGriddle. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. Web page under construction want to know, are McGriddles still the go-to? So apparently they are. Absolutely. Yeah. Always, I like that they're, this they're is well-known. This mm -hmm. is a staple, yeah. Mm -hmm. A little syrup <laughs> on the McGriddle. Oh, oh my man. Gosh. Mm. I think I had a McGriddle once, and I was like, this is just a sugar bomb, yes. like, <laughs> disguised as breakfast. Which Correct. I fully support, and it's funny because it's like it's the most American thing you can probably think of, right? Like, how do we put more sugar in something that's already right. not healthy for you? Yeah. Well, oh, at, at four a.m., they're they're good. They're good at four a.m. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I mean, arguably, everything's good at four a.m. True, yes. true. This is true too. By the way, right. I've seen I've seen Rocky at four a.m. Just to let you know, not with a McGriddle <laughs> yeah. in his hand, but I've seen him at four a.m. <laughs> 
And he didn't, have a drink, didn't have a drink in his hand either. It was no, business. No, it, was, it, was it was business. All business. Yeah. Yeah. It was all business. Yeah. yeah. It was, uh, you guys were telling the story late, uh, earlier about like good brothers and all this stuff. And it's like, oh, yeah, you see people like burping and farting and drinking and stuff. And I was like, oh, you mean after every show? You know, wrestlers <laughs> at a bar? Yes. Like, they're just that all the time. Yeah. Right? Was, we save that for very particular moments. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let, let's uh, finish with one question here, Aubrey, then I'll let you. Uh, do our promos on the way out one question all right let's see all right uh i'm looking for a good one looking for a good one how about Derek lockwood's one down there oh yeah that's a good one uh Derek lockwood on twitter asks favorite movie favorite song singer band favorite tv show what are your favorites in other media Whew. okay that's a loaded one uh favorite movie pulp fiction okay nice cool. um favorite show of all time probably breaking bad Mm. Very cool. Um, favorite band, The Beatles. All right. Ooh. Old school. Real uh, old school. Yeah, real old school. Um, what else is on there? Favorite what? Favorite song. Favorite yes. song. Oh, my gosh. Favorite song. That's so hard. That's so hard. Uh, favorite song. I don't know. So for some reason, <laughs> Let It Be came to my head, but I don't think that's my favorite song, to be honest. We're just going to let it be. We'll it let is, it be, though. You know it, it, listen, it's hard to pick a favorite song when you there's <laughs> so, so much out there. And you have so many, I'm sure you got a playlist. And I'm sure you got your favorite song on that and many, many yeah. more as well. Honestly, I'm too eclectic, I think, of like a music that I like that I could pick one yeah. favorite song i'm with you i'm with you, you know? I, I, that's why i kind of like the beatles because they were all over the place you know? sure they were yeah yeah i like i like people like that i like kanye west because he's all you know like his music oh, is yeah. all over the place you know right. so like i like people who create music and not and just don't stick to their one genre kind of like go nuts you know yeah rocky thanks for your time brother it's good talking to you good seeing you as always and we hope to see a lot more of you soon thanks for having me appreciate y'all no problem and now to take us out Here's Aubrey Edwards. Boom. All right. You can listen to this podcast every Thursday, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, all of your favorite podcast platforms, new episodes with awesome people working with AEW, and we have video episodes every Monday. Check uh, YouTube and just search AEW Unrestricted. You can watch Elevation on YouTube on Mondays. You can watch Dark on YouTube on Mondays. You can watch Dynamite on TBS on Wednesdays, and you can watch Rampage on Friday on TNT, we're everywhere, all the time. So much awesome content from AEW. I am Aubrey Edwards, along with my best friend, Tony Schiavone. Thank you for listening to AEW Unrestricted.